This is Greg Malden, and you're listening to the Shares Podcast. Welcome, everybody, to an exclusive episode of The Sheriff. Guys, today I'm blessed to have another one of my idols right in front of me right now. And ladies and gentlemen, I would like to share with you a story that's not only a true story, but but a story that inspired me when I was doing my research for my current guest. An eight-year-old boy from Quebec City receives a a table hockey set gift from his uncle. Now, on the day of his birthday, he receives this gift. Up to this time, this boy has not followed hockey, as his family's from of Haitian descent. He receives this gift for his birthday, plays this table hockey game all night long. At the end of this night, the Chicago Blackhawks and Montreal Canadiens were about to start their game. I'm assuming the game was in Chicago. The game was a little bit later. Now, this boy happened to want to watch this game now that he's played this table hockey all night long as his gift. By the end of the game, the boy is very content. And it was at this time when he turns to his parents and says, Mom, Dad, I want to be a hockey player. Ladies and gentlemen, this guest would would turn from a boy to a man. He was the first Haitian-born player to ever play in the National Hockey League. This gentleman is also a role model and icon, as well as a father and coach. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Claude Villegrain, how are you doing today, my man? Fantastic. What an intro. What an intro. That's the best so far I heard. (laughs) Well, you know, I wanted to get a little bit creative. Claude, I'll admit, I'm a little bit nervous because you're obviously a big deal for me. I wanted to have you on the show for a long time. Now, When I started doing my research, Claude, what I love about it the most is the fact that every story is different. Now, right away in your hockey DB, I saw that you were born not in Canada, but in Haiti. So I'm like, wow, this is incredible. I can't wait to get into this. I can't wait to find out when his family moved to Canada. I love to hear the story about guys that made it all the way when they started, how they got started, what inspired them. So when I now, Claude, I, I, I might have to correct myself. Was it your eight-year-old birthday that you received the, the, the table hockey game? Yeah, March 1st. And then, uh, and then uh, like you said, there was a game at Montreal against Chicago. And I, uh, coming from Quebec City, I thought, well, I, I'll cheer for Montreal. And uh, Montreal, I thought Montreal lost uh, five to four, but I realized afterwards that the CH on the Montreal jersey didn't mean Chicago. So I thought I was cheering for the wrong team. Uh, but uh, no, I everybody laughed. I just laughed and I happened to sit down and the TV was on. And that was the year I think Montreal won a won Stanley Cup with uh, Ken Dryden as a rookie. And I watched and I watched and I could relate for having played about two, three hours on the tabletop hockey game. And uh, that's how I started, man. Man, I I couldn't tell you how much I enjoyed like learning about that. I think it was like a video interview that I learned about that. Now, and the reason why it resonates with me, man, is because I was exactly the same. I love those. I love those games. I remember having one that that like you described in this story. And then I remember getting like the really good one, Claude, with the bubble over it. (laughs) And and the players are actually plastic and they're not, they're not uh, paper anymore. And and I'm not the same era. (laughs) But, 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 but even those games there though, Claude, I mean, this is all pre-internet, pre-social media, right? Things were just different. Like I, I believe that we just appreciated the games a little bit more back then. We weren't able to rent them from the video store. You know what I mean? Yeah, but the funny thing is, uh, I think as two years ago, one of my b- best buddy here, uh, he uh, he bought a tabletop, just the bubble one, and he had it in his garage. And we played, and I, I kicked his ass, but that's another story. But 
you know, like as soon as I started playing, I it took me back way back when when I first played, and that was surreal. That was surreal. Yeah, yeah, and and I, you know what, I'll have to admit, um, Nintendo games were a little bit about of my upbringing as well, but I'm talking more about the Nintendo, the Super Nintendo, Claude, like games like NHL '94, like. When, when when you were close to when you were around, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, like that's yeah. when I first started playing the hockey games too, man. Ice hockey, blades of steel games like this. You know what I mean? Like, like I know the listeners that, that recognize these games are, are old school like us. So yeah. shout out yeah. to everybody playing the old school hockey games. Now Claude. So as I, as I mentioned in the intro, brother, when I'm very curious to know, <clears throat> when did you guys move to La Capital? Well, um, my dad studied for about seven years in Quebec City. He, um, four years of economics and uh, three years of uh, agriculture. So he went back to Haiti, worked for three years, but his dream was to go work in Africa. But uh, he applied and uh, he couldn't get a job, but that's another story there. But uh, he, uh, he was at the symposium and then somebody told him, why don't you go back to uh, Quebec City? Uh, the government needs people like you. So my dad thought he would try that. And I think I was 18 months old when we, we went to Quebec City and the rest is history, as they say. So, so now, Claude, the, now I have, I have a, a, a vented interest, I guess you could say, in this Quebec City part of, of the story because I've had the opportunity to live in Quebec City. Okay, mm -hmm. so I've lived in Quebec City for two years, for two hockey wow. seasons. I lived in Montreal for three, and I've lived in Jean-Pierre up, no up, <laughs> up, yep, up in Saginaw well. for another no two, Claude, because I played in that, in that senior league that turned into the semi-pro league. And, yeah. and you know how they pay their tough guys pretty oh, good. I it, know it, that league. <laughs> it used to be really good back in the day, right? So, so I played in that league for 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 about six or seven seasons. Mm -hmm. But Quebec City, man, man, there's something special about that city, Claude. Oh, yeah. I would just walk to the park and be able to have a morning skate all on my own on ice that's just as good as the arena outdoors. Mm -hmm. And this was in every park in Quebec City. Was it yeah. like that when you were growing up? Definitely. Uh, we, uh, we didn't have, well, where I live, we didn't have an indoor rink. So all our games were outside. And I can tell you, I, uh, I played a lot of hockey uh, every weekend, Saturday morning from nine until nine at night. And yeah, that was, that was a good time. That was a good time. So, the kids don't play like that anymore. I know. I know they don't. Where exactly did you guys live in, in, in the city? Well, uh, the, the town is called Charlesburg. It's, okay. it's basically a suburb of Quebec City. Yep. But now it's all Quebec City. And it's yes. just one town. And then, uh, yeah, I grew up there. You know, uh, just started to play hockey. I was playing baseball, soccer. I was a, actually, I was a better baseball player. And I played some soccer. And, but hockey was my passion. And, and thank you for sharing that. So now, I, you, now you mentioned baseball, Claude. I, I find that that baseball is kind of part of the Quebecer story as well. Like yeah. a lot of people play baseball, especially the hockey players in the off season, right? To stay active, to keep that competitive spirit alive. I, like a lot of people don't realize how big of a sport baseball is in the province of Quebec. Yeah, you know it was I mean? a, yeah exactly. Uh, we didn't have the um, the skills development camps like we we have now. Uh, back then, that you played either soccer or baseball, and you know we had the expos. We're big fans of the expos, and and uh, after the expos uh, left, uh, you could you could see kids playing less and less. But uh, one sport that got very popular was football, and football is very popular in Quebec now. Yeah, they got some great team, great coaches, and. Le Rouge et Or of the University of Laval is a, is a strong program. An absolute powerhouse, man. I lived probably 
maybe about a five minute walk from the University of Laval in Quebec right. City. My second Same year that I lived there. Oh man, right. I, my gym Claude was was in the unit was the gym in the university. You know what I mean? That was my membership. Man, it was it, it's an incredible place. Like I, I thought being from yeah. Toronto, all those Toronto universities. My sister went to Western. I, I seen these schools. I thought they were the powerhouses, man. But you guys in Quebec City, I'm <laughs> telling you, you guys are like a hidden sports gem over there, man. Yeah. yeah. No, it's a, it's a great place. Uh, Quebec is a great place. It's beautiful. And uh, I, I, I go back every year and I can't believe I live in a, such a nice place. Uh, it's like Europe next door. After spending seven years myself in Europe, I could attest that uh, if somebody wants... Uh, uh, experience uh, Europe and go to Quebec, old, old Quebec, old Montreal, and it's pretty impressive. It is impressive. And like, I remember having, having this conversation with some of the guys that are from Ontario that played in that Quebec league when there, when there used to be like pre pre like now Claude, you have to go through the system, the major junior system of the Quebec major junior league, you have to go through the system of Newfoundland or the Maritimes to be eligible to be able to play in the LNH now, right? Where before they could just sign any player from anywhere. That's when the Chiefs yeah. were getting guys like Garrett Burnett and Sugden and, and all those guys, right? And and so so now it seems like they're really building a Quebec-based pro league that are all Quebec players that went through the Quebec system. And I believe in their vision. They've gotten away from the five to 10 fights a game. They still have a tough guy on each team, yeah. but it, it, it's just, it's a good balance code of, of the rough stuff, the skill and pure Quebec talent. And I had have to give a shout out to the LNH because they're, they're right at the end of their first round of the playoffs right now. And it's literally really good hockey that's being played. It's a 16 league. They're getting their seventh team next year in St. Rock. R-O-C-H. Is that how you pronounce it, Claude? Yeah, Rock? Saint Rock. Saint Rock. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, for sure. So, Claude, yeah. now, now this is all me being a fan of the game talk. <laughs> I want to talk about you growing up in Quebec City. Like the when when you started playing minor hockey, what was that like, brother? Because I know that there was nobody that looked like you, probably as far as Montreal. Yeah, well, definitely. The only the closest guy would be my, my younger brother. But yeah. uh, I, rem I remember, so this is March, and I tell my, after watching that game, I tell my parents, hey, I want to play hockey. Fast forward November, because we need some ice <laughs> and snow. And uh, so I, I get, I register, get the jersey, socks, and I, I, I show up at the rink. I don't have any pants. I don't have, I got some gloves, a helmet, and somebody tells my parents, uh, hey, yeah. Uh, Claude needs a shin pads. He cannot go on the ice without shin pads. So uh, my mom goes back home and try to figure out something. It's not like you could go to a sports check or something like that to, to, to buy a pair. So she found two uh, Sears catalogs, pretty thick back then. And then she, I put them inside my, uh, my socks. And then, hey, I had played with those. And good thing I had, I had those catalogs because I was on my knee my knees all game long. I couldn't stop falling. And that's how I really started. And by the time I was able to stand on my own feet, on skate the next year, I was skating around circle, around people, scoring goals. I spent the whole summer playing ball hockey. So uh, I knew, I, knew uh, I wanted to be a hockey player. <laughs> yes. Now, now, this is where I get very curious, Claude, because I had two younger brothers, right? And I played. So I saw the whole, you know, as a kid playing to when he gets to an adolescent to an adult three times over, right? In my family, as guys, my sister played too. So you could say four times if you like. Now, what interests me is when the kids start getting really good, like the best players in Toronto, which I definitely wasn't part of that group, started getting really, really good was usually around the 10, 11 year old age. Now, my friend, when I researched about you, you caught on to this game so quickly, some of the articles that said that people just couldn't get over it. Like, like so I read that you would imagine 
you would have dreams of being on breakaways and scoring goals. And you really developed a passion for the game at a young age. I'd like you to talk about a little bit about that, Claude, if you don't mind. That's, fun, that's funny you're saying that. It's because sometimes I walk with my wife and then uh, all of a sudden I'm, I'm 10, 15 feet in front of her. And she goes to me, uh, are you on the breakaway again, Claude? <laughs> so it's still to this, to this day that they know I'm thinking hockey when I'm watching TV with them and I'm humming. Mm, they know I'm thinking hockey. And growing up, and that's what I, I do a lot of coaching and skills development. And I, I always tell my kids, um, you, you got to don't just do the drill. Picture yourself in a situation. Growing up, I, I would go in the basement and I would have my hockey stick and play like shadow hockey, like shadow boxing, but shadow hockey. I had the line with Guy Lafleur, Jacques Lemaire, C. Shot. And I can't write it in that. And I was a commentator and at slow motion and replays. And I was making all kinds of plays, but that, that was a way to uh, think the game. And, and one day I watched the 72 series. Oh yeah. And that took me to another level because like I said, we don't have any, uh, well, there's some hockey schools here and there, but uh, you don't have any skills development. Summer, I just played soccer and hockey, but, when I saw the Russian play in 72, first of all, I was so mad that Canada had a tough time, but and I was happy when we won. But after that, I, I was telling everybody I, I wanted to play like the Russians. And, and that's why my game was kind of shaped around that. So no, no, and thanks for sharing that, Claude. Now that's very interesting. So now 72. So that would have made you about nine years old at the time yeah. Of, yeah. of that. So that's when you really, really started becoming a student of the game because you had something to actually watch. Like, ladies and yeah. gentlemen, we have to remind the younger generation, Claude. I have to remind them. There's no computers, ladies and gentlemen. There's no iPads. There's nope. none of that, okay? So yeah. when we get a series on TV, like, like that Summit series, that's our internet at that time. Well, I have to watch. There's no uh, VCR. <laughs> we didn't have any VCR, so you couldn't uh, miss the game. So the last game, uh, when Paul Anderson scored, all the schools had those, you know, they used to have TVs. They, they rolled in the school. And everybody, all the classrooms, everybody was watching that last game. And when Paul Anderson scored, the, the school went berserk. Uh, people were throwing books outside the windows. And, and I'm telling you, that was an unbelievable moment. I was nine years old and grade four, I think. And so that's the way it was. And you missed the game. <laughs> You have to wait till you're at 2022 <laughs> to, yeah. um, to, to see it. That's pretty cool. So, like, with the time difference, you guys were actually watching the games during in school. In the morning, hours. I think. In the morning at wow. school. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's that was crazy. all across Canada. That oh, yeah. All across Canada. I ended up playing with guys that uh, had the same stories. They had the TV in the schools and everybody was watching. Yes. So now being from Charlesburg, okay, was there like, like a team kind of flowed for, for, for Charlesburg or was there a team for the whole city? Like, like how did that work with the minor hockey once you started getting extremely good at the game? Well, well, I would say um, um, Charlesburg would be like being a Scarborough, for example. Yeah. You know, outside the big Quebec City, yeah, and I was playing for the double A for the um, the Charlesburg team. So, and then when you get to midget, uh, a triple A, you would play for the governor, they used to call them the same for the governor. So, a triple A, you play across the whole province, and then that team used to win the, uh, a lot of you know, the um, Air Canada. Now it's Telus, and then it used to be Air Canada Midget Tournament. Yep. And it started by being the Wrigley Tournament. Remember the Wrigley Gum? And the, so uh, that, was, that was it. But me, uh, me growing up, uh, I was making all those teams. I, I would make the double A teams, the triple A teams, but my buddies didn't make the team. So I would go down with them uh, lower level. I would score tons of goal, try all kind of stuff. I learned the toe drag and stuff, stuff like that. But uh, I would get called up double A. I would get called up triple A in the first line. I would be doing well. They wanted to keep me. I said, ah, no, sorry. I'm going back to, to play with my friends. 
but what that did, I, I had a lot of fun with my friends, a lot of touches, a lot of puck control. Uh, I could try anything I wanted. And that's how I got better because, I, as I mentioned earlier, there's no skills development, barely nobody. I never went to hockey school. So that was, that was, my, that was my thing. Yes. So now a, a couple other things that I was really curious about, Claude, um, to do with this kind of time here is the, the big Quebec Pee Wee tournament. Mm-hmm. Did you compete in that? Was your team? Yeah, one time. Yeah, one time I did. And we're playing. I remember playing against teams like Young National. Uh, some guys had beards. They were so big. <laughs> I couldn't believe that. And Young National was always one of the top teams. I remember oh, Toronto. The, you're talking about the Young Nationals. Yeah, Toronto Young Nationals. Yes. Yeah. 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 They they were one of the most popular teams every year at the tournament. And uh, we played a game against um, Doug Gilmore. Uh, he was playing for Oshawa. Is that Oshawa? Probably yeah. Oshawa or Cornwall or one of those teams. No, no, I think it was Oshawa. Right? Okay. And he was a big star of the tournament. And so when when the Quebec team played against uh, teams like that, the the ring, the Colisee was packed, like fifteen thousand dollars, a thousand people. Can you imagine? I play most of my game outdoor, and all of a sudden it's fifteen thousand screaming fans, and we beat them. That was a big upset, but that was part of a pretty good experience. Yes. So now, so Claude, when you experience fifteen thousand fans at the the, I don't know if it was the Pepsi Colisee back then, or if it was just no, the Colisee. It was just the Colisee. There was no <laughs> sponsorship back then. No, yeah. no, no sponsorship on the boards and nothing. Yes, and 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 and. For those reasons, is part of why the Nordiques, unfortunately, had to leave, right? Yeah. Because of yeah, endorsements and, and 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 box suites and all that kind of stuff. And we'll get into all that stuff because there there's a a little um, Monsieur Videotron Center that has all those amenities. And and I was actually living in the city right at the end of that of that construction. So we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, what my question was, Claude, is was that your first taste of seeing what the big lights were like? It must oh. have been at that age, right? Oh, definitely. Your first it taste was. of it. Oh. oh, yeah. Definitely. That was every time we played. And if for some reason, a division, we had young Nats. Well, we ended up losing to them, but we had teams from the States. Uh, I remember uh, we played the Hershey Bears, uh, the young guys, and then that was that was weird. Uh, the way they skate, the way their equipment looked like, and 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 the, and that was in a turn because you know you grew up, you play against the same guys at Charles Charles Burke, uh, Quebec City, basically, and yeah. you go to the tournament. It's just the same kids. And that was experience, and and I, you know, there's fifteen thousand, but I, I was focusing on the game. I was so excited, you know. So that was a little NHL. It sure was, man. Um, I'm really excited to get into the next topic, Claude, that I want to talk to you about. And you got to tell me if I'm making the pronunciation right. So the, the Laval Voisin. Yeah, Voisin. Is that how you say it? Yeah, neighbors. <laughs> is, is that what it means? Yeah, that's, that's stupid. Yeah. Okay, cool. So cool the cool. story behind this is that was about a couple of years before I joined the team. It used to be the Laval Nationals where Bussy played. Bussy played there with the big star, Mike Bussy. Yeah. And they, uh, they, the new owner came in uh, a year before I got drafted there. And uh, they were looking for a new, a new college scheme, New Jersey, uh, new logos. And that was the anniversary of Laval. And there was a big anniversary of Laval. And the Laval, Laval would call themselves the Voisin because that was uh, across the river from Montreal. So we're like kind of neighbors. Yes. And uh, it's almost like the Kraken. Like everybody started to vote for that one. And we uh, we became the Voisin. And the first year, they, they, the first year they, they finished last. And then my year, we kind of finished at the bottom as well. And they, they called us the Raisin, the Raisin, Laval Raisin. And then I, I, I came from the double A and I couldn't understand. Well, I couldn't understand. I had a good camp, but they kept only uh, three veteran players, the captain and two returning players. 
and everybody was new rookies and we we played we're pretty good rookies we play hard but you know, no experience you know the junior level yeah and we finished last and and then we figure out why we finished last because at the draft the, the two super midget coming up were Sylvain Turgeon and Mario Lemieux I guess who we got <laughs> we got Mario we went from uh, the Laval raisin raisin to the Laval super raisin <laughs> yeah Yeah, yeah, you right. can say overnight. Okay. So when you guys drafted Mario, that was after the 81 season, after your rookie year? Yeah. Okay. So I went from uh, number one center, and uh, two seconds after they named Mario, it became second. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, uh, to your defense, everyone else on the planet would have to be in the same situation. It wasn't, yeah. it wouldn't just be you, oh, yeah. right? <laughs> Well, you see guys like Crosby, uh, guys like me, David. Nobody remembers the other guy <laughs> that we were on the team. There was uh, there's a big, big gap between the talent. And Mario, uh, I remember his first training camp was unbelievable. He uh, he was too strong for us. I don't think he he sweated once, and he he would do things that uh, that Suk was doing. The puck handling, the one timers from the goal line bar down, and uh, I I really uh, watch. I was uh, he was playing, and I changed my game to uh, mimic his. And when we really? had the one on one drills or things, I was going hard. I was I think I was the only guy that could stop him, and that, that kind of helped me because I ended up uh, getting drafted that year. But and uh, and then the next year. Uh, we were tie him and I as uh, on second All Star team behind Pat Lafontaine, but that was pretty special when he got here. Where uh, we went from uh, three thousand three hundred people in the stands to three thousand, and half of those were scouts. So yeah. yeah. So Claude, how big was he as a sixteen year old on the team? Like he's six foot six, right? Everyone knows Mary Lemieux is being yeah. six foot six, but, but was he like? Six four when he got there was he yeah, short? Six four, uh, yeah, it's almost the same height, and uh, he had a long stick, and he uh, he was doing thing like <clears throat> you know like a tall guy, the puck in the skates didn't matter to him. He never lost the puck. He, he he if he wanted to score, he would score. That was amazing. Him and I we killed the pe they killed penalty together, and uh, we played on a power play together and. And it was, it was so easy playing with him. So good. Well, I mean, the numbers kind of talk for themselves, Claude. Like your second year in the league, you're getting a point per game. Mm -hmm. Your third year in the league, buddy? I don't know if you might have broken records, but, you know, you had 46 goals. You had 126 points in 69 games, Claude. Yeah. Right? Now, what I want to – I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. What I want to ask <laughs> you about – was your first year with Mario, you're getting a point per game. You also get drafted to the National Hockey League. Now, you go in the sixth round, 107th overall, to the Detroit Red Wings. My question is, where was the draft, and did you go? Oh, yeah. It was in Montreal. No way. Really? Yeah, it was in Montreal. There's a bus ride, so I took the train. They, uh, our agent, like uh, – From Montreal, we took the train and uh, we sat in the forum. So that was a special, oh, wow. special moment. So, wow. So uh, I, I was supposed to go in the first two, uh, two to three, third round. And so I wasn't nervous at the start. Um, I had the same agents as Scott Steven. He was sitting not far. I couldn't speak English. So uh, I, I, I didn't really talk to him, but he was like first round pick. And second round arrived, and I was I was getting nervous. And I know Detroit was interested. They thought having a black kid in Detroit would be perfect. Buffalo uh, yeah. was interested, and Minnesota for sure, and and Washington, I believe. And then third round, not many. Fourth round, fifth round, and then because I was the year that they Quebec had the big trade with the, uh, uh, Dale Hunter. Oh, so, yeah. 
So it took a long time, the first round. So they said, we'll, uh, we'll take a break. So I thought I wasn't going to get drafted. So I, I go across the street by myself. There was a McDonald's there. And one of my buddies was there. So I had McDonald's with them. And I was kind of, you know, disappointed. So I come back inside. And one of the uh, Washington Capitol scouts uh, uh, ran into me and said, don't worry, till you're going to be drafted. So I didn't know what he meant by that. But so I, I get in, a, I get in a, the, the rink and I hear the first pick. And I forgot who it was, but then I go to my seat and I sit down and I heard my name. And, and now, now I have to go down on the floor. I heard my name. And, but the, the problem was I didn't hear what team because <laughs> I was going outside to sit down. So uh, I go on the floor. I go straight to the Buffalo's uh, uh, table because I know I knew they were really interested. And then uh, I go and I go shake uh, Scotty Bowman's hand. I can't speak English, and I shake his hand, and he goes, "I don't. I think you got the wrong team, kid." I was like, "Oh, okay." So my agent comes on the floor. What team? What team? So, I don't know. I thought it was Buffalo. So, and I could see the table, the Detroit table, waving at You're me. Waving. So, Come on. So uh, I ended Come up going over. there. Sat there with the, it was the Norris family there, and my English wasn't good at all. But I was just smiling with my little Detroit hat and. Uh, but uh, <laughs> I just want to go home. I didn't want to sit at the table anymore. I wanted to tell everybody. Yeah, so. of course. Yeah, of course. So now, Claude, and, and, and that's an amazing story, man. Thank you for sharing that. I, I love the draft stories. And, you know, one reason, Claude, and, and I want to get your take on this, because, I mean, you got to look at the age when we were drafted, okay? So we were drafted when we were 18 years old. OK, mm -hmm. so now I know I understand that we're in major junior. I understand that, you know, we, yeah. we may have moved away from home for a year or two, but pretty much up to the point of 18. It's our whole families that have been involved through and through with our hockey careers. Man, those early mm -hmm. practices, all the, the, the four or five, you know, events every week. You know, it used to be a winter thing. Then it turns into a year round thing. I mean, Claude, it's a big commitment from our families. And, and in my opinion, I find that the NHL draft is a family accomplishment. That's how I look at it. Do you, do you, do you see it like oh, that? It, it takes a village. But um, back, uh, back in the days there, like, I was just playing and just having fun. And it's not like uh, you, you got those camps in the summer. Uh, you got all those... Um, Team Alberta, yeah. U18, Canada U18, and stuff like that. And you could see the progression of players and they're rated. Uh, you know, if you do well, junior, get drafted, get invited to camp, and that's when it starts. And my parents, they know nothing about uh, about all this. And I wasn't playing AAA, so I wasn't really uh, paying attention to that. And uh, – uh, my last year at Bantam, my dad told me, um, uh, after, after midget, you're done hockey because our local junior B team practiced on Wednesdays at 11 at night and their games were on Thursdays at 1030 at night. And my dad was school, school, university, university. And I was going to a private school, which was uh, downtown, and I had to get up at 530, 6. Anyway, so he said, pick another sport. So me and my buddies, we started <laughs> to do some skiing. So we were skiing, still playing hockey. Our team wasn't that great that year. And uh, so there's a bilingual exchange. And the people from Kipling, Saskatchewan, they come to our school. And then there's a second leg, you go to, you go to uh, Saskatchewan. And then uh, in the meantime, we, we, uh, we a big upset. We won our league. And I thought, yeah, good way to finish my hockey career. And I go to, I'll go to Saskatchewan, never been west of Montreal. And I thought it was great. But the, the, our coach uh, tells us, hey, we're going to provincials. And that was the same time as going to uh, uh, over there. So I didn't know what to do. And then our best center, best goalies, best uh, defensemen, they said, hey, the heck with this. We're going to Saskatchewan. <laughs> and then uh, I, um, 
I, I said, well, it's my last hockey. I'll go to uh, the tournament, saint Saint. And uh, first game, we lost to Hall, Quebec, 9 nothing. And I thought, oh, my God, I should have gone there. <laughs> Second game, I think we won in triple overtime, then double overtime, then semi in overtime. So we're playing our last game against a team that beat us 9-0. And, and during the game, I could see uh, my dad getting annoyed. People keep coming and talking to him with those hats there, those pads. And, and uh, I had a great game. Uh, we, we beat that team 5-2. to two, And we won Provincial. So, uh, so fast forward like a week later, the Quebec draft. And everybody at the school, they tell me, uh, hey, go! You got drafted. What does that mean? You got drafted. I didn't know nothing about draft. Eleventh round by Laval, and I said, "What does that mean?" So I go home. I get a call from Laval, and they say, "Congratulations, we drafted you." Blah blah blah. And they said, "Oh, I can't go to Montreal and and school and stuff like that." So I I hung up, and then they call again. The manager called, try to explain, "Oh, you're gonna live in Montreal." Blah blah blah, and. Uh, weekend game and stuff like that. So I tell that to my dad and I tell them, hey, I, I got drafted. He looks at me and keeps reading his paper, didn't understand. Anyway, they finally came down and start talking to my parents and me and my, my parents uh, didn't want to have nothing, nothing to do with that. And then uh, we had a deal with them that could go to pre-camp and that was it. So my dad thought, you know, I was too nice of a guy. Uh, I would go to camp and then uh, be cut, and that's it. So I come back from that camp, and two days later, they come back with a pair of skates, a stick, and they want to sign me. Oh, that was that was, uh, that was was hard. And my dad didn't want to have nothing to do with that, and my, my mom didn't want to be in the same room. So my dad kept asking questions to uh, – to the, the gurus of hockey in my town. And they said, oh, it's a meat market, uh, Alex. It's, uh, he, he, he'll be pumping gas at the end of that. And besides, you people have weak ankles, so you can't, you can't uh, play hockey. And my dad said, well, but basketball players are black. Football players, they, got, you know, they need their ankles. They're good players. So I think my dad got insulted a little bit, so he signed on the dotted line. And then... Uh, I became a hockey player. So, yeah. Oh, Just yeah. Because so, I was the course is I was playing baseball and I hurt myself. I got to camp with a uh, crack ankle. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so Claude, how was your billet situation in Laval? What was the family like that you lived with? Well, the first place I went to, um, the family, the, the, the husband, he's still a good friend of mine. The husband, he, it was, uh, he was one of the uh, score he in charge of the scorekeepers at the Montreal Grand Prix. So oh, wow. every year I'd be, I would go and I'd pass to go everywhere on the Grand Prix slide. Uh, you know, that was, that was a great experience, the v, VIP rooms and everything. But I was young, yeah, I couldn't enjoy that. I enjoyed that the way I would right now, actually. <laughs> but um, And then, then they divorced after the second year. I ended up going to my aunt's place for the third year, but... Oh, cool. I had a good time there. Yeah, because you know how important the billet situation is for a major junior player. Like, I like, okay, Claude. So I want to ask you, because I got you on right now. Now that we're (laughs) older, man, we both played major junior. We both know exactly what it is. I was OHL. You were Quebec major junior. The schedule, the pressure, the intensity, the expectations – I could go on and on and on. Everything is similar to professional. Yeah. The only difference is, is that these are 16 to 21 year old kids instead of 20 to 35. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And they're only getting paid little amounts of money per week. <laughs> right. Yeah, 20 bucks a week. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it's the same type of pressure. Like, you know what I mean? Like you're, you're, you're going to Laval, you're trying to fit in with the team. You, you have all the pressures of high school. You're, you're fitting in with a family that you've never met before that you're expected just to live with and get along with. Like there's so many things for a young man. That's, that's a big expectation for the average 17 year old, 16 year old. And then on top of that, you got to perform, you got to compete. You want someone taking your spot. Like that's insane to put on a teenager. But we did it. We got yeah. through it. But if our billet situation 
wasn't good. If we were uncomfortable oh. where we were living, that would be enough to throw us off because oh, it's such a big definitely, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Now uh, I was lucky. Um, my builder was also uh, um, uh, the 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 woman worked for the team as well. So um, a big advantage. Uh, yeah, and so that helped a lot. And then, yeah, you know, like I was young and, and I I wanted this so badly and. And it's not everybody that could adjust. I know a lot of people, a lot of guys, they just went home. They miss home. They miss their buddies yeah. and stuff like that. But uh, no, the, that never was never a factor. And, uh, you know, I followed my dreams. How cool was it to get those first pair of skates for free and first, like, couple sticks? I loved it, man. I thought it was the best <laughs> thing ever. Well, you know, the tea... Uh, Okay, they remember when I said they came with a pair of skates, they were just showing me the pair of skate tax the tax super tax were the coolest thing ever. And then by the time I got to camp, it wasn't tax, they had to deal with uh co skate. Yeah. Everybody had co skate, and we had Cooper stick, it was supposed to be Sherwood, but Cooper stick curve A, B, and C, and they were th thick, they were like tree trunks, and then uh. And in practice, we're playing with a thicker stick, so we didn't break the sticks. And the goalies, you know, <laughs> had to have a thicker stick. And it, the owner was so cheap. And uh, the next year, we drafted Mario. We still had the the same sticks and the same the same helmet, the same gloves. And, and every day at training camp, there was a company coming in with cold stick, cold skates, a share wood. Uh, Cooper, uh, what have you? There was like two dozen there in the back just for him, and we were oh, yeah. <laughs> and he's trying to like it, and we're I was still with my C curve, you know. And uh, so halfway through the year, I asked, I remember asking Mario, "Hey Mario," <clears throat> because you could see all the sticks in the back, you know, and then the skates, the gloves, the nice gloves, you know. I had the big leather one that was so heavy. And then I, he was uh, on taping a stick. And I said, do you have any sticks you don't want to use? Just one. Just give me one. <laughs> and then uh, he looked at the stick. It was split underneath. You know, when it used to be split underneath. And yeah. said, oh, you can have this one. And it just, it's almost like a kid. I went in the back, like nobody to see me. I had that fiberglass tape, went around, and I played. That was that's the first time I was able to do a real saucer pass, two drag. Nice wrist shot. I played about 10 games with the same stick. And <laughs> when we were playing a Sherbrooke, I go in the corner and I, I jam my stick in the um, Zamboni door. Broke. Yeah. And I look at my blade. I stopped playing. I look at my stick, broken. And then I went on the bench. Trainer gives me my C curve Cooper. And that was, <laughs> that was the last time I had a good fish stick playing during it. That's awesome, man. I, I love the little stories like that, Claude. Um, so I think it was I think it was Coho that Mario ended up getting the big endorsements for, like when he got pro, right? Because yeah, yeah. because when I think of Mario, like especially when I was young, young, I, I'm thinking of Coho. So so I think at least for the stick, I know he was playing. He, he was playing with Sherwood, Sherwood Junior. And uh, I'm not sure his last year. His last year he had a nice Cooper helmet. Yes. And, and Cooper, Cooper helmet, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, but I know uh, when he got to the pro level, he was cool. Oh, yeah, 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 for sure. Mm -hmm. So now, okay, Claude. So now, as a as a fan of the game, this next part, I can't wait to get your your take on it, your answers, because I'm a guy that went through the system for hockey. I know what's what when when how when guys do well in their last year of junior. I know like what the opportunities are. Now I heard you say your father, big education guy, right? Yeah. Yeah. Now your father being the guy that went to school for so long, how, how important that was to your family, how important it was for him to have his son do the same. So yeah. now Claude Vilgrain, your last year junior, you had, 126 points, including 80 assists, 46 goals, okay? So now, in my year, a guy that had numbers like that, if he wasn't a first-rounder, he would probably be offered first-round money 
as a signing bonus. Yeah. If he was a first rounder, he'd be offered the cap with 126 yeah. points, the maximum. Okay. Yeah. You're a Detroit Red Wing draft pick. Did they offer you a contract, Claude? Like, I just, I, I find it mind boggling <clears throat> that you did not sign with Detroit for the maximum amount, even though you're a six rounder. Now, we got to remind everybody, I can, and trust me, I know I'm going on too long. I can't wait for your response. We have to remember this was a time that was a little bit different than today's year, age. Yeah. Yeah. And I know that has a lot to do with it, Claude, but I'd love to hear your take on it. Were you offered a contract from Detroit Red Wings? Of course not. My story is a little different. Remember when I told you I sat down with the Norris family at the, um, at the draft? Two weeks later, they sold the team to, uh, to um, Illich. Pizza guy, little Caesar guy. Okay. And uh, so I'm at a training camp. Uh, I'm getting ready to go uh, – um, to to a NHL training camp in Detroit, and uh, some of the guys on the team were receiving like letters and flights to go to the camp. So, and then one my captain was drafted in Detroit, uh, also, but he got his stuff. He was second pick. So I kept asking my agents, uh, "How come I'm not getting a letter?" Yeah, and so finally. Uh, so finally, uh, I called my agent one day. That doesn't make sense. Everybody has gone to camp. So my agent finally told me. The reason he told me is just because my dad called him. So he had to say it. He said, Detroit, you know, they had too many guys in the farm team. They had Kalamazoo. They had, like, uh, Adirondack. They had a, a, a over 50 players. So they wanted to train, uh, train that down to a manageable number. So... I was not going to get invited. That was that was a shock to me. I I couldn't breathe. I was alone in my uh, in my uh, villa uh, uh, house, and then I, I tried to call my dad. I couldn't talk, and he knew because he had just called the agent, so he knew, and I couldn't. I I that could have been dangerous. Like uh, uh, I was I was losing my mind, and then anyway, so I never got invited. I had my great, uh, uh, a great season that year, and at the end of the season, they uh, they gave me the choice uh, a contract in Kalamazoo, twelve thousand dollar a year, the U.S. and uh, to pay for apartment and everything, and a twenty five game tryouts at Adirondack, and uh, my dad's uh, and I had an offer from uh, Jean Perron to go play for the University of Moncton, so my dad said. Eh -eh. You're going to Moncton. And I, I didn't argue. I just, I went to Moncton and then uh, that was a good path for me. Okay. So thank you for sharing that because like, I'm <laughs> just, welcome. I know, but I'm like, Claude, I'm blown away with what you just told me. Like I'm a no, hockey no guy, offer. bro. No, no, no this offer. is, this is I'm, I'm, a, I'm not only am I a hockey guy, but I'm a stat guy. So I really pay attention to the numbers. And I can guarantee you that if a player undrafted scored 126 points his 19-year-old season in major junior, he would be able to pick from about 10 offers, 10 teams, where he wanted to go. Yeah. And he would have a solidified spot on the AHL team, if yeah. not a shot to make the big club. So yeah. the fact that you weren't invited to the team that you were drafted to, there's some, there's more to that. Well, no one, the, no one knows, but well, I might like my agent told me like um, I uh, I was I was um, put back to the draft. Okay, and so nobody knew I was back in the draft. Like well, David Ball told my agent, "Oh my God, we didn't know he was back in the draft." And people find that out later, later, later. And then, uh, you know, maybe it would have got drafted, invited. And, and there's other reason maybe too. You know, like I played in the Quebec League. That year got drafted. I think only 17 of us got drafted. You know, uh, you had to be a Mario Lemieux or, you know, one of those guys. Hey, look, Krabitai, how far he got picked, you know. So he needed to have either a superstar or close to uh, they play in Ontario uh, or the Western League. 
to be drafted. Wow. Um, Mind boggling stuff. So now we're at Moncton, University of Moncton. Now, I'm sure they knew that they were getting a guy in yourself that really they got really lucky to get. Like they knew that yeah. you were a lot better than the average recruit, <laughs> yeah. right? So, but yeah. did you get treated that way when you went there is what I'm uh, trying to get at? A little like, bit. You, you know, like, like a the, superstar the re- that you were. The reason I got there, first of all, I saw the team winning uh, the national championship that, uh, that spring the spring before, and uh, and that summer I was a tryout with the national team for the Olympics in Sarajevo, and Jean Perron, Jean Perron was one of the assistant coach. So that's how I got to Moncton. So he, they signed me there, the scholarship and everything, but but Jean Perron ended up going to Montreal, coaching the Canadian. So the assistant coach, uh, I don't know, he he was the 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 new coach was an assistant coach, and you know sometimes the university. Uh, the, the you got to pay your dues. Uh, uh, the 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 senior they got to play more. Yeah. So I was I I wasn't playing power play. I wasn't doing nothing. And when I was doing so, something would happen. And it took in the playoffs to realize that, geez, I got to play more because we're not doing anything. And I see that a lot. Of the seniors don't show up in great shape. And I finally figured it out in the playoffs. But I should have been playing more. And then. The next two years, uh, it went well. So yeah, but I mean, I mean, the first year it went well too, buddy. It went really well. Like you had thirty-one points in twenty games. Your, your freshman. Well, that year. was more, mainly towards the end of the season. Oh, okay. You started so, to play me. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. And the next but, year, that was a good year. And then it was I was all Canadian. And the last year, I got injured badly on the knee, and and I missed some time. And I I, I was basically limping all season long. Even at the national, I, was, I, I, I still played well enough to get invited to Team Canada. Yes. Now, Claude, what I, what I find cool is that, like me mentioning that I'm a stack guy, when I see, like, like the, 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 the coolest thing about your career is you, you have the three years in Laval, then you have the three years in Moncton, then you have the two plus years of playing for Team Canada. Then, you know what I mean? So you have these, like, different parts of your career. Every single time that you have multiple seasons for the same team, you improve, you get better and better. So what does that tell a hockey guy that played? It tells a hockey guy that you are extremely coachable, that Mm -hmm. everybody must have liked you because if this assistant coach didn't like you, then he would have been fighting with that assistant coach for you getting ice time. And no, 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 no. They all liked you in order for you to progress like this. Okay. You earned the respect for this to happen. You embraced the system and you just got better every single year. Right. Yeah. So to me, it's like, like I couldn't get over it. Your second year in Moncton, did you break records that year? Well, Do you probably, know that? I don't Cause remember. it didn't have things online, but back then they didn't like always like name things. Now it's like yeah. every athlete has their own day of the year. It seems right. Like, yeah. <laughs> you know, Fred Van Vliet Day in Toronto, Drake Day in Toronto, you know, all this stuff's going on, right? They didn't do yeah. it as much back in the day. But yeah. I'm telling you, brother, 35 goals in 24 games, 63 points in 24 games. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, 64 points in 24 games. I think you probably got some records that year. I know you're not worried about that. It's always yeah. about the success of the team. But... To just see that kind of progress, you know what I mean? How proud was your dad at this time? Like, not only are you getting your education, but you're just killing it <laughs> on the ice. My dad was always proud, uh, no, ma- no matter what, you know. So he was a big fan, uh, you know. Like, he always said, if you want to do something, and you know, be committed, you know, work hard. And uh, especially being a black kid, you know, never give – a chance to uh, be dismissed, you know, always show up, hard work, be honest and stuff like that. So that's what I was trying to, uh, to do. And you're talking about uh, improvement and stuff like that. And during the p- pandemic and, uh, you know, uh, there was no hockey and they showed a lot of the, the old NHL classic. And, 
And first of all, I look at my era and I said, geez, was I that bad a skater? So I had to <laughs> watch, I had to watch some of my games that, oh no, those guys were bad. And I, I look at the, I looked at the coaches behind the benches and the different coaches. And, and I thought, there's no way I could have played with that guy for that guy. And I go back to who gave me a chance. So I, 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 I go to Team Canada for two years. I was on a tryout on a tryout because I came from university. Most of the guys were we came from an NHL team. And Dave King finally told me that, you know, we want to know some offense and we we want to make sure you could play D as well. So at two years I was on a tryout. There's about 100 players that went by. So I finally played two years with Dave King, Olympics and all. And then I had a tough time. I go to Vancouver. Uh, I signed as a free agent, but there's no coaches back then. Uh, Pat Quinn and Brian Burke uh, uh, drafted me. And then uh, and I knew I was in trouble when right after the Olympics, I had my first game for a couple of the practices. I, I didn't know if I had a line. Coach never talked to me. And uh, five minutes before getting on the ice for my first NHL game, he comes in. He can barely say my name. And he goes, uh, hey, what position do you play? <laughs> okay. So uh, I just said Santa. And it was sarcastic all game long. Hey, you're not playing against, against Japan, Villagre. You're not playing against Finland. Every single shift. And my second initial shift, I go on a breakaway and beat Extal. You know, I thought I was going to play 10 years in that league at least. And still even sarcastic. And whoa, whoa, whoa. then Claude, and I have to interrupt you. So that Hextall, I saw a clip of you going through its whole team and scoring on Hextall. Is that yeah. the game? That's your first game. Yeah, this game? is the game. No way. That man. old game. That was your that, first game. Yeah, that was my first game. And then uh, he, uh, he, you know, I was so happy. I scored my first initial goal. I, <laughs> but he was condescending all game long. Every game was condescending. So, and then, uh, and then, uh, and then the next year, I don't get a sniff. Ended up in Utica on the loan, and finally made New Jersey. And with Tommy McVie was my coach in Utica. So, Tom McVie. So they, they, huh? Tom they McVie. Me, yeah, Tommy. Yeah, Tom McVie. So they sent me uh, a team in Milwaukee. The farm team was doing well. We we're twenty-five and four. So they, they wanted to play the young guys. So they sent me to Utica. Utica was one fifteen and. 115 and one, and I got there. And I remember uh, 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 flying in uh, uh, the Rochester airport, uh, CRQ airport, and that yeah. little guy with a big voice comes in and to pick me up. And you know, we drove the two hours and a good conversation. And we went, we won 15 straight. So I ended up spending three years with Tommy. Uh, I, I would get called up a couple of times and did well, but always sent back down and finally Tommy became the coach and he called me uh, no I made the team uh, they needed a left wingers a left winger because the right wing was jam Shanahan McLean Lemieux Claude Lemieux so I so I I, tw- I played sort of 10 games on the left wing and I made the team and then as I mentioned earlier I was watching some of the coaches and then he said it always took one or two three years People had to get to know me to say, oh, yeah, he can really play. And then they play me. Oh, I should have done that a year ago. And then some of the other coaches in Philadelphia couldn't say my name. Never had a chance. Never had a chance. And that's when I realized, you know, coming for, you know, triple whammy, a black guy, French guy, Quebec League. And right, right away, uh, wrong sport, weak ankles, <laughs> things like that. So... So after looking at this, I said, I, I needed to, I, w- I would have needed to sign at the right location. Even when I went to Europe, I, it took me forever to get a job there. I was between me and a small town, me and a guy from the East Coast League. And I, I, and I ended up playing three years there and win a championship. And like only four years ago, I ran into my GM and then asked him why he took so long. But they had to put it to a vote to the fan and the sponsors at the donor uh, to see if they're okay having a black guy on the team. So that's why I had to get uh, go through. And I spent three years there and the fan ended up loving me. It took three years. And that, that was my path. Yeah. 
Now, Claude, I just, I, I have to add to what you just said, okay? Now, hearing, hearing that, for me personally, when I hear you say that, where what had to happen, there had to be a vote to see if the booster club and this group was okay with them being a black player. So when I hear that, first of all, I, I feel uncomfortable because it's not right that it had to happen. But secondly, I'm almost like right away, I'm, I've, I'm thankful because I know, Claude, that that uncomfortableness for you, that those feelings that you had, because you were able to get through that and flourish, you created opportunities for so many people after you, Claude. And you mm -hmm. have to understand that. You have to, you have to be given so much credit, Claude, because not all, I'm not just talking about contracts. I'm talking about life experiences. I'm talking about supporting families. I'm talking about opportunity. You've given so many people opportunities because of things that you not only had to go through, Claude, but you got through it and flourished. And I just want to thank you personally, just because we're on this topic right now. Well, thanks, man. That's uh, much appreciated. Um, yeah, that was that wasn't easy, man. I always say uh, the generation between uh, Willie Ori and the PQ Subban of the world, uh, we had to basically look the other way. Uh, look the other way. We just we just wanted to play the game. And I always tell the story of my first junior game. Uh, we were playing Montreal across town rival. And I stepped on the ice. That was in Laval. And the fans were, the, when I went on the Montreal side, and, and then the, the chanting, like the monkey noise, go back to Africa all game long. I was that small when I was uh, uh, at the, uh, you know, yeah, the whole game. And I went back to my billet and I couldn't sleep all night. I, 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 I said to myself, I can't let them win. So, I have to decide if I want to be a hockey player, that this would be part of my path. And um, I had all kind of experience in my life, and I just looked the other way. And every time I want to, uh, you know, let's say I would get in a fight right away after, hey, did he call you and where yeah. did you do this? Yeah. Because I was, you know, and the thing that used to bug me a lot, you know, I went to that team in Utica, New York with Tommy McVeigh's team, and I was a big star, you know, just radio, TV, ads, and everything, and everybody chanting my name, and you mentioning Fletcher. Fletcher, he, he, um, Stephen comes in, we play against him, and the fans all over him, all game long, the N-word, the monkey sound, and then like, the same people that was, you know, cherishing me, and my teammates calling the N-word, and said, hey, I'm sitting beside you, so I don't know, no, you're not, you know, you're not like, you you like us, you're not like him. It's like, what's that supposed <laughs> to mean? I'm not like him, you know. Of course, I'm not on the same team, but, you know, then they would do the same thing with a French guy. No, 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 you're more like us. Not, you know, so yeah, that's what I had to go through. And, and you know, Claude, like, like, just, like, like, just, uh, just, to, you know, because I'm thinking about it right now. Um, the first thing that comes to mind is is George LaRock. Now, I had George LaRock on, on the show probably about six months ago. And he told me growing up in Sorrel that he would be called the N-word, not only by parents on the opposite team, but parents on his own team. He would hear <laughs> yelling that. And he'd see this. And he's 9, 10, 11 years old. And how he got through it, and, and, and I, I wish I could confirm it right now, Claude, but I'm telling you, he said older Quebec hockey players that came out and talked about this, and I believe that you're one of them, Claude, gave him the strength to say, if they can get through it, I can get through it, right? Yeah. So it's a small example of a terrible thing, terrible thing, Claude that a kid has to go through. Can you imagine if that went on now? Like, I know we're getting examples. We can talk about it, but I'm talking about minor hockey. Like, it, it's not accepted now, Claude. No, but I, I'm part of the, um, 
uh, Equality, Diversity, uh, Inclusion uh, Committee for Hockey Alberta. Yes. And uh, we're trying to, uh, you know, work on and work on those type of things. And you don't know how many times I get called from a, a mom or a dad wanted me to talk to his kid because he went to the penalty box and, you know, parents do it from the other team doing the clock and, and call it N word or stuff like that. And that really? new generation of kids, they're shocked by that. They're not used to it. <laughs> I could tell them a story myself. I, uh, you know, the movie Roots? Uh, yes. Yeah, it came out later in Quebec because they have to translate it in French. So that was a big show. Everybody was watching it. And I was that's when I was midget. So when I was playing midget, I was scoring a lot of goals, a lot of points. So every time they would announce a goal, a bunch, a bunch of fans in the stands would go, they would say, score by Claude Velgrain. He said, no, Kunta Kinte, all game long. For the whole season, that was... That's what I had to go through beside the N-word and stuff. But these days, these days, the kids, they don't know how to deal with that yet. And I'm, I, I, I go and talk and talk to them and they say, follow your dream, man. Those are, don't let those guys win. That's what Yes, of course. And, and Claude, like I, another thing, and like we might as well talk about it now. Like another thing that I, I wanted to talk and get, get your opinion on is, you know, in today's game you know the the alliance that you're a part of for the alberta board the hda the hockey diversity alliance the 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 hockey player of color movement the hockey equality hockey is for everyone seaside hockey i can keep going because there's a lot of them okay so now what's the difference between now and let's say 10, 15, 20 years ago, is there was no things like that. That's the difference. So things are happening now. There's organizations that are government are government funded that if a kid wants to come and play hockey, if his family can't afford it, he can come. He can get equipment. He can play a game that 10 years ago he wouldn't be able to play, Claude, mm-hmm. because – if there wasn't programs like this, registration would continue to be down for visible minorities. And the only players that would have an opportunity to make the NHL would be privileged kids that have en- that their families have enough money to allow them to play. Okay. Yeah. So that's the reality. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I thought you were... No, no, no. I, I'm, I'm just... I, I get all... Yeah, well, it, 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 um... I have close friends that are running these programs, just like how you're a part of that Alberta program. And it's great progress. It's great progress. But part of it, Claude, that I believe that if we want to see hockey be more diverse, not only do we need programs like the ones we just mentioned, but we also need to celebrate the history, Claude, yeah. We need to celebrate Claude Villegrain. We need to celebrate Willie O'Ree more, Mike Marzin, Bill Riley. People don't know no, that. You almost, no. you almost sound like Anthony Stewart. Um, on Tuesday, uh, the truck comes to Calgary, the, the, the Black History uh, Truck Museum is coming. So that's a way uh, to, to uh, you know show people the pioneers and Hockey's been uh, black hockey's been around for 100 years, and uh, you know I went to drop the puck at the Canucks game as the first black Canucks to play, and and then uh, it's funny you mentioning all this because I, I talked to Anthony Stewart like uh, a month ago, and uh, he he said something you know every February, that's almost like we come out, <laughs> you know, every February, and then we have to, and then we go on the air hibernation for another 11 months, <laughs> you know what I mean? So he's working with the NHL, and the NHL is going to invest a lot of money to have us, uh, the old guys like us, be more prevalent, and be, you know, you know, go to talk speech, go to speech, uh, do speeches, and things like that, go to all-star game, and just... To the, the, it's not just the Black History Month when everybody needs to do something because I get calls, all the calls, all the time in February. And then March, I got to wait another 11 months. But uh, yeah, the difference is there's more people that 
that are willing to help. I know the NHL, they want to, they want to do something, but they don't understand how. And then and I think Anthony was able to get through them. I know I talked to hockey, NHL diversity, and they, they try to do stuff, but they, 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 they don't know how to go about it when you got, you know, guy that's been there for so many years and there's a certain way and they don't really want to change that type of thing. So. Yeah, no, for sure. I, and, and I, I, I love the fact that you brought up Ace Stu. Um, me and Ace Stu are friends. We've been family friends for an extremely long time. Um, Ace Stu knows my passion about this topic. Um, I'm loving hearing you bring up his name because any type of talk is good talk. And I'm not yeah. hearing anyone else's name come up so shout out to mm -hmm. ace too i'm an advocate for this stuff i grew up being playing in arenas being a triple a hockey player looking around and seeing nobody that looks like me okay so did you so did anthony anthony played with my younger brother patrick all the way up that's how we know each other so well okay yeah. so what we're, what we all want is the same We all want the next generation to not feel that way. We want exactly. to have the same opportunities as everybody else, right? So yeah. let me tell you something. Mr. Bill Riley, who is just, just released a few days ago, we talked about this in depth. Mr. Bill Riley was number three, Claude. Mike Marzin was number two, okay? Number two and number three played on the same line for the same team. At mm -hmm. the same time. Yeah. Not too many people know that, Claude. No. I didn't know that. I'm number <laughs> 47. I'm number 47. I'm going to look to see what you are. I think I'm 13. 13. You're 13? I think somebody told me that. I, like I, I, I was going to estimate between 7 and 10 because um, Bernie Saunders is number, is like number five. And oh, yeah, you're right. No, not 13. I forgot. It's a lower number than I that. think you're before that, Claude. Because so he, now, he got so now, a, so now Claude, see this talk. Yes. Yeah. See yeah, this talk, guys. Claude? This is exciting stuff. Why is it partly exciting? Because it's never talked about. Mm -hmm. That shouldn't be the case. It should be exciting because we're celebrating it. I did not know that Mike Marzin... And Bill Riley played on the same team, Claude. That's that's not cool that a guy that is into hockey as much as me, yeah. a fellow black hockey player, didn't even know that. The NHL is not recognizing these things. Bill Riley, as I'm sure you would, you would love to do as well, Bill Riley wants the NHL to hire him so he could be a consultant slash counselor to young players, not just players of color, To all players. Exactly. I'm sure if the NHL approached you and said, you know what, Claude, we need our, we need our players, our history players to be more involved with the game. We're going to give you season tickets to New Jersey because we want you to be at as many New Jersey Devil games, as many Vancouver Canucks games, as many Philadelphia Flyer games as possible because you are alumni and we have to see the younger generation see this. We want to see Bill Riley and Claude yeah. Villagrain and Mike Marsden. We want to see those guys at the ring because we want to look up to them and we want to learn about them and we want to know their history. And I'm an advocate for this. I'm going to work as hard as I can to make this a reality. If you ever talk to Ace Stu, tell him that he's got he's got an alliance over here right yeah so so i'm telling you this this is exciting stuff but just what we're talking about right now claude proves that that the nhl is not recognizing this brother you know what i'm saying well, they're like, trying but slowly but it, it, I, yes you got because give credit i, I talked to the nhl diversity a lot and that's their biggest uh, roadblock but uh yeah the they want to do exactly what you've been saying and One day it will happen for sure. Well, I, 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 hope that, I hope and wish that I'm a part of that because it's a really big passion of mine, Claude. Um, yeah, so, so yeah, we're getting fired up. We're all, we're all into this now. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's great. Um, now, now, Claude, obviously, obviously you're an extremely interesting guy. I have to kind of pick and choose the topics because I want to respect the timeline. But now... I need to talk to you about the 91-92 season, bro. Okay? So now the 91-92 season is the season that you played 71 games for the Devils. Okay? You put up pretty much 50 points. 
Mm -hmm. Okay. That was your first year that you were really given an opportunity. Now, this is what I want to highlight though. Do you understand? You and a lot of people. <laughs> say it again. Sorry. You and a lot of people. Yes. What I want to highlight though, is the fact that, do you understand you had a plus 27 plus minus rating? Oh yeah. I was six, first in the team and six in the league. Now, for the listeners that want to understand what I just said, a, a, a plus minus rating is the amount of goals you're on for, the amount of goals against that you're on for, and they do the ratio. If I was on for two of our goals, but, but on for one of their goals, I'd be a plus one. Mr. Claude Vilgrain was a plus 27 on the season. Now, how good was the team that year? Yeah, it was a pretty decent team. We had a pretty good team. We had, uh, that was the, the year so that the Fiti of the world show, showed up. Fiti Sof, Kazatonov. Uh, we had uh, good Swedes and Stefan Richet and Peter Stashny. So we had a good season. And the funny thing is, going to my last game against the Islanders, I think I was first in the league. And uh, for some reason, that that game, we my line and with... Uh, uh, Stevens and Weinrich on D went it up minus six, <laughs> but uh, for the game, but no, that was that was no, that was a feat. Uh, I got a trophy, donated the money to a charity, and uh, really, that was pretty cool. And then, uh, yeah, that was a good year. It's one of the, one of those years I didn't want to make any mistakes. Good passing, I was playing sometime with uh, Peter Stashny or Stefan really? Richet, so uh, yeah, that was a good year. Wow. So Until I got injured. <laughs> yeah, no, I hear you, brother. I hear you. Another year that I wanted to talk about was, now I know earlier, earlier you mentioned you were comparing the Tom McVees of the world with some of the other coaches and GMs that could have given you opportunities, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and in Philadelphia, obviously you weren't given a big opportunity, but your numbers were so good for Hershey that they had no choice. But to call you up, they had no choice. Oh, I mean, they called me up, but they they called me up, and then uh, I. For when I first got there, my line was uh, with Dave Tippett. That was last year, and uh, Dave Brown. So uh, every time I got called back up, I was playing with that line, and that was hard because we barely played. And then, uh, <clears throat> uh, you know, Tippett was a little slower. And Dave Brown is Dave Brown. And Dave Brown wanted to puck all the time. And Dave Brown oh, kept, kept saying, uh, move your feet, move your feet. What? what do you mean, my feet. I'm the only one on the line that moves my it moves their feet. <laughs> and then uh, and one thing was frustrating. That was the first year, I think, of the commercial break. So oh, when there was a commercial man. break, he got on the ice, whistle, commercial break, and then they would send Eric Lendros back on the ice. And by the third period, there's no over, no more ice automatically. So that was frustrating. But, you know, so one of those things, a coach could barely say my name. He couldn't say my name at all. Uh, the guys called me Chocolate Rocket. That was my kind of my nickname. The Chocolate Rocket? And, yeah. And uh, yeah. And then uh, they called me Rocket. And that guy just, hey, Rocket, hey, Rocket. He couldn't say my name. And then we're in the Florida. The, the place is empty. And the only thing you could hear when I was on the ice, rocket, rocket, rocket. And just <laughs> and goes back to what I told I tell you. Uh, these that guy in the Vancouver they didn't want to have nothing to do with me. So I had no chance. And me, I was trying so hard to impress them. You know, it was time to move on. I, I hear you, man. I hear you. So now time to move on is right. There comes a time in every pro player's career where he has to make a decision. Is he happy with the status quo or is he ready to see something different, right? And my man, you had a pretty long, successful career across the mm -hmm. pond overseas, yeah. right? You had the three seasons in Switzerland, two seasons in, the, in Germany's DEL, correct? Yeah. Okay. And uh, finished two more seasons in, uh, in Switzerland. In Switzerland. Uh, I really... I really enjoyed uh, Switzerland. Uh, again, uh, you know, being a black man in Europe, when I get out of my uh, my uh, network or people don't know who I am, I'm just a foreign, you know, immigrant or whatever. And you don't know how many times I got stopped in the street. I had to show my passport. 
And, but, you know, that was part of my life. You don't know how many times I had to show my passport with Team Canada, traveling the world. And uh, uh, I had a good career. I made some good friends. I'm going back there helping one of my friends for the hockey program in July. Uh, but, uh, you know, like I always say, uh, look at my hockey DB stats. And a lot of people would say, geez, I would give a right arm to have those stats. But the path, you know, to get there wasn't easy. You know, people don't understand. Like I could have a coach giving me shit. I was sorry about the word, but no, and I fine. go on the ice. I go on the ice, and then the one player can, he calls me N word, and the same time the fans call me, uh, you know, monkey sound. And then I come back on the bench. I get heck from the coach again. So nobody had that. So you know, there was but, lots uh, of reasons to quit. Yeah, and then I, I never. I said I'll never quit. I just love the game, you know. I, you know, if 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 I start fighting all the time, you know, I, they want to get into my skin, and I, I I thought I would never let them do that. But a lot of the coaches, that they wanted me to be, uh, you know, they just assume we're all tough guys, you know. <laughs> yeah. You don't understand that maybe you know I can play some hockey, you know. No, I mean, I tell people here in Calgary sometimes, I say, oh, yeah, I played hockey and then, and then I played seven years in Europe, stuff like that. Oh, you must have been a tough guy. Because that's <laughs> to to a tough guy. Because I'm a black, angry uh, man. Well, <laughs> yeah. So. Well, they're so used to seeing Big George, you know, Donald Brashear, yeah. you know, all these guys, that. right? And then they're just trying to associate the players but i mean the claude Villegrains, the anson carters there's a lot of skill jerome mcginlick i mean the man did it all right but, but yeah. there's a lot of skill black hockey players and a lot of the fans kind of associate the black player with the george larock donald brashear type player right and that might be their favorite player but they're associating yeah. it with that type of player Right. So yeah. I've noticed that as well. I don't help the stereotype. So <laughs> I'm sorry, Claude. <laughs> but, um, okay. you, you but got you had good hands. You had good hands. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Hey man, I had a hat trick in junior. That's my claim to fame for the yeah. Oshawa Gens. <laughs> um, so so listen, just just to lighten it up a little bit, I want to talk about okay. The first thing I want to talk about, you, my friend, raised a pretty, pretty incredible woman. Okay. <laughs> now you had the opportunity to coach her at a pretty young age. Yeah. Now I, I was reading these articles and like, apparently you were saying that it's just a whole lot better coaching the females than the males. Is that how, is that, well, do you still feel that way? Well, it, it, it was until I kind of coached a little bit last year, but <laughs> that's another story. But uh, no, for, she uh, she saw Team Canada women winning the goal in Salt Lake, and she wanted to play hockey, and ended up uh, Cassandra. Coaching... Cassandra, yeah, yeah, Cassandra. Ended up coaching her um, um, on, until she, for nine years, and she got a scholarship to UNH. UNH, and then she finished at UBC, and then she uh, she played pros in Sweden as a pro in Sweden, and then she wanted to come back and play here, but the lid folded. So yes, she got a job at IT company, but now she's working for the Hitman as a communication uh, social media coordinator. So pretty really proud cool. of her. Yeah, shout yeah. out to Cassandra. She's yeah, a big she's fan a of her father, player. man. I'll tell yeah. you that. Yeah. I was listening to some of her interviews to try to get some more info on you. And oh, I'm like, yeah. wow, does this girl ever like her dad? <laughs> no, she's way better. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's awesome. I love the relationship that you guys have. Okay, so listen, Claude, man. The Calgary Buffalo Hockey Association. I watch something on you guys. I cannot believe this program. I cannot get over it. Now, I believe the video was from about four or five years ago. Yeah. Are, so how long and are you still a part of this? Uh, I, um, I coached a team for four years and me and uh, the co uh, director, they wanted to have a program so that when the, when the players from Bantam level, Midget, you know, U16, U17, they come to me, everybody, everybody knew how to play the game. So I would mentor 
the coaches, a lower level. And it kind of worked because uh, by the time they got to me, uh, I didn't have to uh, work on a lot of systems, just work on skills. And the start of the year, we were like too much for the other teams every year, fast and like mid-season form. And then did that. And I've been working with uh, uh, skill programs with some ex-Team uh, Canada guy. And then this year, I'm, going, I'm taking over a U18 team for a, a prep team. So. Wow, I like to coach. I, I I'm on a BIPOC uh, coaching uh, uh, association, so networking with all the uh, all the brothers, and then, uh, we we got all the symposium and stuff like that, and it's pretty cool. So I'm pretty excited for this year. Wow, I mean, Claude, honestly, like I didn't know, I didn't know, because because it, it doesn't say it anywhere. Trust me, I did a lot of research. I'm very happy to learn about what you're currently doing right now. Yeah. But when I was watching that, that Calgary Buffaloes Claude, man, just, just the, just the routine of the kids, the mindset that they had. And then, and then I listened to your part when you talk and you're just kind of like, I'm like, man, this is like, this program makes that U S U S national program put to shame. I mean, these kids are going to school. They want to have a great mindset. They want to have a positive attitude. They want to work in the community they're talking about, doing all yeah. these things while being mentored by you. I, I was blown away by that. I was very impressed. Oh, that was incredible. You know, some of the junior team, uh, the Western League, um, when they had some of my players, they, uh, they, they would rather send them back to me. And, and some of the guys were disappointed because they wanted to play, but they felt comfortable that they knew they were going to be coached well and almost like a prep program, a prep school program, and which were, were not, but everything was run the same way. So, uh, so I had a good relationship with scouts. And then, you know, like, again, I'm going to start again this year and I'm looking forward to it and I, all kind of ideas. And, and these, these kids are going to be blown away. Yeah, man. And Hey, any kid that gets the mentorship of a Claude Vilgren is, is, is a huge advantage. I really appreciate you taking this extra time, buddy. I, I, I trust me, I'm, I'm not taking it for granted. I really appreciate it, buddy. It's an absolute honor. Um, I got to put you on the spot though, Claude, because there's a lot of, of other things going on that, that's going to be able to come up in the positive nature. Are, are you, are you willing to come back for a part two on the sheriff podcast? Part another four hours for sure. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, buddy. I know I'm putting you on this spot. I'm just messing yeah. with you. Hey, but, um, okay. but yeah, you know oh, if, sorry, go ahead. It's go. my way to, you know what? It's my way to get back. I give back on the ice and uh, that's my way to get back. If I can help you in your show, hey, by all means. Oh, you're, man, you're helping me big time. You are a huge part of history, Mr. Bill Grain, and I really appreciate it. I was on the edge of my seat hearing some of these stories. I've never seen a path, a journey path like yours before, and this is a guy that's seen a lot of different situations in hockey, man. So I want to thank you again for coming on. I also want to thank the listeners for tuning into another episode of The Sheriff featuring special guests. And, and, and I want to also say, guys, that... The things that we were talking about, about the history of the players, I'm so grateful to get your take on that because you are, like, I want to I remind you, Claude, you're a huge part of hockey history, brother, and you need to be celebrated and, and, and it needs to be magnified. And I'm glad we were able to talk about some of that on the show. So um, we're going to sign off now, guys. Woo!